Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our virtual forum, Morris Hope One Youth Outreach. Before we get started, I'd like to run over a few housekeeping items so you all know how to participate in this evening's event. First, all lines are on mute. If you have a question, you will have the opportunity to text them into today's presenters. Please type your thoughts into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send them in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them throughout the Q&A session. Similar questions will be combined and inappropriate or offensive questions will not be announced. And due to time constraints, please keep all of your questions on topic. If you experience any technical difficulties at any point during our presentation, please explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Lastly, we are recording this meeting and the event video will be available on our YouTube page within 24 hours. Please subscribe to New Jersey OAG on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Flickr for the latest updates on news, information, and resources from our office. Now I'd like to hand things off to our hosted moderator today, Morris County Sheriff James M. Gannon. Good evening. I'm Morris County Sheriff Jim Gannon. I will be your moderator and the host for an exciting webinar on opioid awareness for youths and parents. A special thanks to the New Jersey Office of the Attorney General and the Morris County Prosecutor's Office for their direct participation in this event. Here we have General Graywall, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the State of New Jersey, and Prosecutor Carroll, the Prosecutor of Morris County, the Chief Law Enforcement and Mar uh, Officer of Morris County, joining with us tonight. So uh, we're very, very uh, thankful for both of their participation. Uh, the subject of opioid awareness needs to be kept at the forefront of people's minds. How to raise healthy children who don't experiment with or get hooked on drugs. Uh, dealing with a substance abuse disorder isn't what youth and teenage years are supposed to be about. Uh, I'm personally the father of a daughter who has two beautiful young children and nothing makes me happier than spend time with them as they're happy. Uh, I look at their faces and imagine that the love and intense protective feelings I have towards them is what most parents and grandparents have felt. No parent wants to imagine that a future of rehab and recovery programs and possible overdoses await their children. In Morris County, where I serve as sheriff, we've had 71 suspected fatal overdoses as of this past week. This time last year, we had 65. It's an 11% increase. Suicides are up too. A program that I'm particularly proud of is the Morris County Sheriff's Office Hope One program. It's a mobile program that is staffed by a plain clothed sheriff's officer, a mental health advocate, and a certified peer recovery specialist. Someone who's suffered through addiction and found the strength and courage to get clean and teach others how to avoid the temptation of drugs or get well through recovery and treatment programs. Hope One was started on April 3rd, 2017, and since then, has been out in the community sometimes as often as seven or eight times in a week, offering help, training people in the use of Narcan, and just listening. The Hope One team will explain what they do later on in this program. Now, it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, Acting Morris County Prosecutor Robert J. Carroll. Prior to his very recent appointment on October 14th, just last week, as Acting Morris County Prosecutor, Robert Carroll has served since 2018 as director of the Law Department of the New Jersey Turnpike Authority, the largest toll road authority in North America. He previously served as acting Sussex County prosecutor. Back in 1986, he was appointed to supervising deputy attorney general in the organized crime and racketeering task force at the New Jersey office of the attorney general, being promoted to task force chief assistant attorney general in 1989. In that capacity, Prosecutor Carroll investigated and prosecuted major New Jersey criminal enterprises and public corruption. Among the convictions of major figures, Carroll's unit investigated and secured a conviction on the infamous Iceman killer, Richard Kuklinski, and prosecuted the hierarchy of the Lucchese crime family. Prosecutor Carroll also served as assistant prosecutor, supervisor of organized crime and special prosecutions, and was a county investigator at the Essex County Prosecutor's Office. He also was many years involving involved in a private law practice. Prosecutor Carroll has acted as an instructor for a number of law enforcement institutions, including the New Jersey State Police Academy and the Essex County Police Academy, and served 
as a, a member of such organizations as the International Association of Gaming Regulators. Uh, he has a bachelor's from Wake Forest University where he was a standout scholarship football player and he has a JD from Seton Hall University. I have to say I've known Prosecutor Carroll from those early days when I was in the Homicide Unit. Prosecutor Carroll is a very sophisticated prosecutor who knows the issues and is very dedicated to working with the community here in Morris County and partnering with both private and public sectors to be effective in tackling the issues of addiction and mental health. He understands that addiction is a disease. He's truly a prosecutor's prosecutor. I wanna personally thank him for attending this webinar while he's transitioning into his new office. Without further ado, Prosecutor Carroll. Okay, uh, good evening. Sheriff, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Attorney General Graywall, for the inviting me to this presentation. As the Sheriff mentioned, I've, I've just started my new position. I was very pleased to join and support the Hope One Project. Uh, although being in the office only a few days, I do have a long history as a prosecutor. And during my decades of service as an attorney, I've also learned how to defend persons and entities accused of crimes. This dual exposure has enabled me to see our citizens and our law enforcement from the proverbial both sides of the table, uh, but especially the collateral pain that's suffered by families of defendants involved in crime related to addiction and mental health. I've always believed in teamwork, uh, teamwork between law enforcement agencies, but even more important, teamwork between the community and the police departments and so forth that serve those communities. That experience allows me to also recognize that the Hope One Project is providing an important service to our communities uh, right now. First, it has already saved many lives, an incredible benefit by any measure. Second, it also provides on-site educational and on-site educational component to families searching for answers to help for addiction and mental health issues by providing a different type of alternative to a person submitting to the frustration, depression, and hopelessness that's been so amplified during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I was especially excited to learn that this modest and original effort by the Sheriff Gannon and his team in Morris County, with the Attorney General's support, uh, has been expanded throughout the counties of New Jersey and the results of providing both education and in certain cases, actually saving lives are worthwhile efforts that will no doubt save countless lives in the future. I applaud both the General and the Sheriff for making this outstanding effort. One final point, as a prosecutor, I take protection of our citizens as a paramount duty. I see another benefit that this project has and will continue to provide. Lives saved through the Hope, of Hope One services have an opportunity to redirect their lives into a positive and productive outcome. This result enables the recovered sub subject and indeed their families to avoid the criminal justice system entirely, an absolute benefit to all. The Morris County Prosecutors, I know I speak on their behalf, believes in the Hope One Project, and we're looking forward to tonight's presentation. Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you, Prosecutor. It's now my honor to introduce Attorney General Gabir Graywall. Governor Philip D. Murphy announced his intention to nominate Gabir S. Graywall to serve as New Jersey's 61st Attorney General on December 15th, 2017. He was confirmed by the New Jersey Senate and assumed the office on January 16th, 2018. Since assuming office, Attorney General Graywall has focused his attention on protecting the interests of New Jersey residents by expanding affirmative litigation, strengthening police community relations, reducing violent crime, and fighting the opioid epidemic. Before coming New Jersey Attorney General, uh, Mr. Graywall served as Bergen County Prosecutor, and Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the most populous county in New Jersey and home to nearly 1 million residents living in 70 municipalities. As Bergen County Prosecutor, he developed and implemented several creative approaches designed to tackle the heroin and opioid crisis, including Operation Helping Hand, which we're all now familiar with, a program that offers low-level drug offender treatment options upon arrest. He also established a community affairs unit, which is dedicated to assisting local departments improve police community relations. General Graywall also worked as an assistant United States attorney in the criminal division of the United States Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey uh, and later 
and also for the Eastern District of New York. Uh, his significant matters in, that he investigated and prosecuted include the successful prosecution of 12 men charged with providing material support to the Tamil Tiger terrorist organization. I was very honored to be on the CT6 team with General Gray Wall on this investigation and prosecution. And I think uh, none of us could have imagined we'd be doing a webinar together here tonight. Attorney General Gray will graduate cum laude with a Bachelor of Science in Foreign Service from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service in 1995. He also obtained his law degree from College of William and Mary Marshall White School of Law in 1999. Attorney General Gray will provides tremendous leadership on not only being a crime fighter, as we refer to the warrior side of the job, in dismantling criminal organizations who are supplying opioids and other illegal substances to the community. Attorney General Gray will also demonstrates compassion to the simple user who needs assistance, who needs treatment. General Gray Wall has demonstrated that he seeks to return that former user to be a productive member of society. Without further ado, General Gray Wall. Thank you, Sheriff, for that uh, extremely kind introduction and for co-hosting tonight's event. Uh, thank you for your impeccable leadership and your friendship over the years, uh, but I particularly want to commend you on your efforts in combating the opioid epidemic in Morris County and for your visionary leadership, uh, in particular with the Hope One van, which is being replicated across the state. Uh, thank you also to Acting Prosecutor Carroll for joining us this evening and welcome aboard. I look forward to working with you uh, on community engagement, namely our 21 county 21st century policing project, uh, as well as uh, in finding innovative ways to continue to battle uh, the opioid epidemic. You know, it's, it's really uh, an honor for me to join everyone on today's uh, webinar. Uh, just to think, a couple of months ago, we were all together at the unveiling of the new Hope One vehicle on the Morristown Green. And that's where the idea of this particular event came about. Uh, talking with the, the incredible peer recovery specialists who were there, the other incredible community partners, uh, listening to them, it made it clear to me that we needed to have a virtual session like this one, especially with Morris County youth. And I'm really happy to see the event come to fruition as it is this evening. And I'm also happy to see the incredibly large turnout that we have. Uh, and. and you know, I'm privileged to talk about this topic with you, which I think, uh, quite frankly, uh, is one of the most critical public health issues we've faced over the last decade and will continue to face uh, in, the, in the years to come. And it's certainly one of the, the greatest student health issues uh, in our state and in our country. Uh, it's an epidemic that doesn't discriminate. It doesn't recognize age or gender, education or background, uh, race or class. Uh, simply put, no one is immune from the opioid epidemic. Uh, some may think that it's been overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic. It has not, it's still there. And even worse, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated in so many ways uh, the opioid epidemic and other pub public health challenges that we contend with and contended with on a daily basis uh, before March, before COVID took over our lives. Uh, I understand that all of our communities are struggling with COVID-19, but what we have to recognize is that it has especially hurt some of our most vulnerable residents. And oftentimes, and especially in the context of COVID, we think about our seniors and those with other men, uh, physical health conditions as being among our most vulnerable. But I think when we talk about the intersection of COVID and the existing uh, opioid epidemic, we have to talk about our youth. and We have to add them to the list of the most vulnerable that we talk about right now. Uh, I can't imagine to, you know, everything that our young people are dealing with right now in adapting to the challenges posed by COVID-19. Many of you who are joining us today are virtually attending school in, in a setting like the one we're using this evening. Uh, others of you are attending classes in person while trying to adhere to social distancing protocols and, and face covering protocols. Uh, your extracurricular activities have, have been altered or, or canceled in, in some cases. Uh, and you can't do the many enjoyable things you did before the pandemic. You don't have the same outlets as you once did. You can't come together as you did before the COVID-19 pandemic. And all of this isolation and, and upheaval really uh, that COVID-19 has brought upon us 
has made all those things much harder, but it has also triggered, as others were mentioning, an increase in, in, in psychological problems, uh, in, in other sort of mental health issues. But unlike in previous times, uh, we now have more programs to deal with these issues, including mental health programs for our youth, which you'll hear about tonight. Uh, programs like Hope One, which gets professionals with the right training and right equipment uh, to people in distress. And this is a big shift for us in law enforcement to talk about these things in a proactive manner. Uh, and it's not, um, you know, it's a shift from how we used to do things here in New Jersey and across the country. But, you know, now we have a greater understanding that people who are suffering from serious challenges who often uh, end up interacting with law enforcement as a result are not going to get better by just cycling through the criminal justice system. Uh, these are complex problems that require creative solutions like those offered by Hope One, like those offered by Sheriff Gannon. Uh, but we need to make sure, again, coming back to the point uh, that we, we was really what we talked about when we unveiled the van, we need to make sure that we're proactive about getting these solutions out into the community. And so that's what I hope to accomplish tonight in this forum. While we're so disconnected uh, because of COVID and all of the other issues that we're dealing with are exacerbated because of it, uh, the opioid epidemic is still there. We wanna be proactive in getting these solutions to each of you and, and let you know about all the resources uh, that are out there. So uh, I'm excited to hear from our panelists about how they are adapting to the challenges of COVID-19 and making sure that they're getting these resources to you and, and how you can access them if you need them. Uh, and know that, as the sheriff said, we're here to help. We are we are acutely aware uh, that we're not going to arrest our way out of, of of the opioid epidemic. We're not going to arrest our way out of these issues. That we have to find new, creative, and collaborative solutions to put people on a better track and to give them opportunities uh, to to work through these issues. And know that you have a partner in my office. You have a partner in the sheriff, and you have a partner in your new prosecutor. And we look forward. Uh, to continuing that partnership and, and improving on it. So with that, I'll kick it back to uh, the sheriff and, and we'll continue with this evening's program, but I look forward to, to hearing your questions and, and, and the discussion we're going to have tonight. Great, thank you, General, I appreciate it, great job. It's my honor now to introduce Tracy Klingener and Kelly Labar who will provide us some good curriculum. Ms. Klingener is the Director of Suicide Prevention Services at the Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris, which I kindly refer to as Morris and Essex. Recently promoted to the Director of Suicide Prevention Services, Ms. Klingener has been working in the mental health field for the last 20 years. She is working towards her license in professional counseling. Moreover, she has a master's degree in community counseling. Furthermore, she is a certified mental health first aid instructor in the adult, veteran, and youth modules. She'd made, she's made numerous presentations on suicide and all variances of mental health to community groups, educators, including support staff, parents, and students. Her clinical experience includes working with sexual assault survivors, at-risk youth, and evaluating adolescents for learning disabilities. Recently, in 2019, she was humbled to chair her first Out of the Darkness Walk. Most importantly, Tracy's committed to educating as many individuals as possible on suicide prevention. She is focusing all her efforts on reducing the stigma of mental illness and suicide. She's committed to this because she's had personal experience with mental illness and suicide. Her objective is to lead the way and light a path for those suffering in silence and give hope back to those who have lost it. Kelly Labar has been providing peer support for over five years. She's been employed by Morris County Prevention is Key, known as McPick, cares since 2018. During her professional career at Prevention is Key Cares, she has been the project coordinator for the Opiate Overdose Prevention Program, providing Narcan trainings and Narcan kits to the seven northern counties of New Jersey. Kelly has been a Prevention is Key Cares certified peer recovery specialist lead on Hope One until her recent promotion to Passaic County Recovery Services Coordinator. This entails managing three grants for peer services, harm reduction, navigation to treatment, and our most recently awarded grant, Bringing Hope to uh, Bringing Hope One to Passaic County. Kelly is passionate about, passionate about all that she does in prevention, peer services, and harm reduction, and is eager to bring new ideas 
to bridge prevention and recovery services to youth. Take it away, ladies. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me here today. So my name is Tracy Klingener, and as Sheriff Gannon stated, I'm the Director of Suicide Prevention Services at the Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris. So what I want to talk to you about today are some important, important signs and symptoms and the way to start our conversation with someone you may suspect is experiencing a suicidal crisis. At the end, I will put up some slides with some poignant resources and post the link to our outstanding and amazing suicide prevention website on the chat. But before I get into all that, let me tell you about who I am and the department I run. About seven months ago, due to the rise in suicides, in particular in our youth, MHAEM decided to implement this new suicide prevention initiative. Thus far in the last seven months, I have been into several school districts, educating all levels of staff and the student bodies. I've also worked with multiple police departments in Essex and Morris counties to better prepare them um, to aid those individuals in crisis. So let's talk about signs and symptoms. If a young person is openly saying they are going to kill themselves, we must take immediate action. So what I wanna focus on tonight are the signs and symptoms that we may miss or dismiss, in particularly with someone we care about or are invested in. So we're gonna start with a change in mood. If your student, your child, your brother, your sister, son or daughter, typically is an easygoing, outgoing, lighthearted individual, then suddenly their behavior changes to easily agitated, confrontational, or they become depressed or introverted and they withdraw from activities that they enjoy and the people they love or spend time with, this could be a sign that they're struggling. Further, if this individual begins giving away their possessions, if you observe that they begin sleeping too much or not at all, and if you notice their hygiene suffering, these could all be warning signs and therefore a reason to start a conversation. But be mindful that all the above signs and symptoms may be typical adolescent behavior. However, we need to be aware that these could be indicators of something far more serious. So now, how do we start a conversation? It could be as simple as just asking the individual if they are okay. We could also let this individual know that we've noticed a change in their behavior and we are concerned about them. So here's the tough part. If you truly believe someone is suicidal and you wanna help them, you must ask the question directly. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Are you thinking about killing yourself? We ask it directly to remove any gray area. After you ask this, it's essential that you listen without judgment. Also, it's a myth that by asking the question, you will plant the idea of suicide in their heads. You won't. Asking the question gives the person a sense of relief and an opening to talk about how they were feeling. Reassure them that they are not alone and you'll be there for them. One important thing to remember, this individual may not be ready to talk. Then your best course of action is to let them know that you are around whenever they are ready to reach out. So now, I wanna speak to every young person on here. I know that you don't wanna get your friend in trouble or have them get angry or hate you or never speak to you again. I get that, I really do. Even if they stay angry, it's better to have a friend be angry and alive than do nothing. Being a good friend means not keeping a secret. So find a trusted adult, your favorite teacher, a guidance counselor, or your mom and dad and tell them. So many folks don't know where to turn. So I wanna take a moment and talk about some resources that are available. So the first one I wanna speak about is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which provides free and confidential emotional support to people in suicidal crisis or emotional distress. And it's available 24 seven. Second Floor is also another great resource. It's confidential and anonymous. And it's a helpline for New Jersey youth and young adults. 
The Trevor Lifeline is a, is a crisis and suicide prevention lifeline for the LGBTQ community. You Matter, which is a safe space for youth to discuss and share stories about mental health and wellness. And it was created um, by the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is another resource. Um, it's a health organization that gives those affected by suicide a nationwide community empowered by research, education, and advocacy to take action against this leading cause of death. In the chat, after I'm done speaking, I will share the link to the MHA EM Youth Suicide Prevention website, which I must say is pretty amazing. Um, this website encompasses warning signs and practical ways to speak to a young person having suicidal thoughts. Furthermore, it features testimonials from young people who have attempted suicide and from those family and friends who have been impacted by those who have died by suicide. In addition to the website, we also offer suicide awareness presentations. I could come to your organization, your school, your place of business, um, nowadays do it over Zoom, and do a more thorough and detailed presentation. My vision for this department is simple. I wanna give a voice to the voiceless and listen to those who are suffering in silence. The only way we remove the stigma off mental health and suicide is by talking openly and honestly about it. Together, we could be part of the solution. Together, we could give hope back to those who have lost it. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Kelly Labar. I'm a certified peer recovery specialist. Um, what that means is I am a person, uh, for me, I'm a person with lived experience in addiction and recovery, and I'm also a trained uh, professional. Um, I'm really grateful to be able to speak on this tonight. I wanna thank the Attorney General um, for consistently pushing to educate and inform um, the New Jersey community on substance use and recovery, and for really seeing the value of peer work with initiatives um, like Operation Helping Hands um, with Hope One. I wanna thank Sheriff Gannon and MHA uh, for partnering with Prevention as Key Cares for the Hope One program. Um, I'm really, I'm quite sure that Sheriff Gannon is proud to see Hope One expanding. Um, all over, not just New Jersey, but other states as well. Um, so, like I said, I'm really grateful to be able to speak on this tonight. Um, I loved hearing uh, Tracy share some of those resources. And um, I'm gonna talk more about the substance use aspect. Um, when it comes to my own experiences growing up, I had a lot of, personal experiences with chaotic drug use um, and alcohol use in my, in my family. And I really did not consider myself to be someone who was at risk, right? Um, to develop the same traits or behaviors. Um, I really thought I was too smart, right? Um, I would never do anything that would hurt my family. I would never do something that would keep me away from the things I love. I really believed all those things that I know now to be stereotypes. Um, I started growing up and going to school and doing all those programs that teach you that um, drugs are bad and pledge to be drug free and I remember being like, yeah, of course, I'm never gonna do that. Like I remember being really into it. And then I remembered feeling a lot of shame because I had experiences with that, but then I'm getting taught how bad all these things are and how we should never ever do these things. And as a young person to um, try and understand what that meant was very hard. It was very black and white for me. 
And I started to um, realize I really shouldn't talk about those things. Um, I really felt alone in those um, in those instances. And I felt like I didn't have anyone to share that with because I also didn't want to talk about someone that I loved or cared about doing something that was bad, right? Um, so it really left me with a lot of shame. When I myself started using, um, I was very young and it was not a great experience the first time, but I instantly was like, well, it's okay because I won't do anything like that again. And um, I won't be like anything I've been told or that I've seen, right? Because I'm different. It's really the same story that everyone tells themselves. Um, and I really believed it. And all those stories that I heard about um, in class or was warned about um, from other people or TV shows, um, a lot of those things started to come true in my own life. Um, you know, I, I did stop doing the things I loved. I did hurt my family. I did become dependent on drugs. But I was so like, but I care about my family, but I think I'm a pretty smart person, but I don't understand how this happened to me, um, which really led to more shame and more isolation. Um, and again, that feeling I couldn't tell anyone, I couldn't do anything about it. And it also led me to the conclusion that I would never get better that I would never be able to stop. Um, as I entered recovery, luckily, I started to realize all the ways I was treated, all the things I was taught, taught all the things I learned, and, and how much better they could be, and how much I didn't want anyone else to have to um, deal with the same things I did, or the same obstacles I had. Um, so that led me to position myself to help people and that led me to a career in the peer field and thankfully um, to a career at Prevention is Key. Prevention is Key has been in Morris County for over 30 years. Um, our director, Barbara Kaufman, has worked tirelessly to build relationships um, through prevention programs all throughout the community with uh, seniors, military, um, and youth, of course, and in schools. Um, as far as working together with prevention and recovery, um, it's, it's something to really help the youth parents understand exactly um, what's going on. Uh, we're, we have, um, a crisis in a crisis, right? That's what um, the Attorney General spoke about. We've been dealing with an opiate crisis um, and now we're dealing with COVID-19 and we also can't just center the conversation around opiates and we can't just center the conversation around um, abstinence, around never picking up. Um, there's a lot of things we can do. And like I said, luckily at Prevention is Key um, Cares, we have the relationships um, to be able to, to connect people and speak with people in all different areas to try and combat some of those stereotypes and some of those myths and fill in the misinformation. Um, one of the things that we can do is we can inform our young people what leads to substance use, right? I don't ever remember talking about that or it was quickly mentioned um, to have someone who works in prevent prevention, to have someone who's, who's in recovery, um, who practices harm reduction, who has an education in recovery and substance use, um, can really open up the conversation. Um, and again, when we talk about substance use um, and what can lead people to substance use, I'm not just talking about opioids, I'm not just talking about if you have a prescription for opioids at a young age, um, the statistics that you will eventually become chemically dependent on them. Um, of course, we all know that, but we need to open it up to more than talking about that. We need to talk about um, that trauma can lead to substance use. 
uh, curiosity. Um, I'm so glad Tracy was here speaking because we need to talk about um, for about undiagnosed and diagnosed mental health issues leading to substance use. Um, it can be a coping mechanism for many things. Um, there can be a lack of resources that can lead to substance use. I came to realize very, very late in my life how much the trauma that I endured led to my drug use. Um, and that took a lot to figure out. And that is something that can constantly be something that needs to be worked on, um, whether you're using or not in recovery or not. We need to open the conversation to talk about, um, to talk to our youth as equals, as peers, to actually li listen um, with no expectation, with no shame, and make sure that our youth know that they're part of our community, that we want to empower them to uh, raise their voices. Um, you know, as Tracy said, a voice for the voiceless, I, I want to raise all their voices so um, they feel heard and, and are given a space for us to listen. Um, open up the conversation to talk about the risks and what damage drugs and alcohol to, do to our bodies. I think we all remember um, that is something we have been doing and do pretty well, but we need to add to that. Um, okay, well, when we're talking about what it does to our body, we need to talk about how can you recognize an overdose? How can we empower youth to um, respond to an overdose to save a life? Could be their friend, their roommate, a family member. Um, we need to let them know about the Good Samaritan law, about their legal rights so they're not scared, right? If they encounter something like that. Um, we need to talk about resources including harm reduction. I love that Tracy put up a slide about different uh, resources for suicide prevention. Um, we need to talk about how there are all different kinds of ways to help people. There's peer recovery centers like CARES, there's detox, um, there's harm reduction services, there's mobile outreach like Hope One, um, but there's also boundaries to those resources so we can prepare people um, that there's all different places to go. We need to talk about um, the societal issues when it comes to drug use. We need to talk about the damage the war on drugs has caused. We need to talk about how language matters to take away that stigma and that shame. Um, Prevention is Key Care's special project. Um, it stands for the Center for Education, Recovery, Education, and Success. It's not a treatment center. We're a peer recovery center, so we're non-clinical support. We offer a safe place to meet people where they're at. Um, anyone can come and sit and talk, can talk about ideas, can, can you know, um, just feel safe and okay and heard. And we need more spaces like that for our youth. Um, the more honest we are in our conversations about drug use um, and alcohol use, the more the conversations will evolve. Um, the more it will spark further interest, uh, maybe in, in, career, in careers, like in prevention or um, peer work or social justice reform or drug policies or law enforcement. Um, you know, having that open dialogue and, and talking to our youth as equals can really um, spark that passion and, and interest and make our community feel like they're heard and able to ask questions um, about the really what they're really concerned about. Um, when we take preventionists and peers and put them in a working relationship in our community, um, which is exactly how prevention is key cares is set up, we can we can really help to um, offer a safe place for people to talk, to ask questions, for parents to feel concerns. Um, prevention does a hidden in plain sight presentation that is just amazing um, to educate parents as well. Um, so there's so much we can do and there's so much we are doing to open up and make people feel like they can get accurately informed and educated. Um, there's free resources like from the Drug Policy Alliance, but again, to have someone 
um, working in prevention and someone with lived experience working together um, can really expand what people think they know about um, substance use disorder. Again, I'm, I'm so grateful um, that we were all able to connect on this tonight um, and that it just came from a quick conversation and we all made it happen um, to the Attorney General. Again, um, thank you for listening to your residents' concern and for all of your hard work and different programs and um, for all the hard work of my team at Prevention is Key Cares and the Hope One team and MHA. Thank you guys. Uh, thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Kelly. What a tremendous job. I can't think of a better partnership uh, than you folks uh, that uh, all together with us in government, you know, the private sector and the public sector getting together is what makes the difference here. Uh, and it all started at Beverly Cares, right, at 25 West Main Street, Rockaway Borough, that concept of Hope One with all the people in the room. So great job. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also right now introduce uh, Corporal Erica Valvano. I call her the mother of Hope One who manages the program for the Sheriff's Office. Erica? Thank you, Sheriff. Good evening, everyone. I'm coordinator of the Hope One Mobile Outreach Unit, and I'm here with our team. I have Officer Chelsea Whiting, our certified peer recovery specialist for Hope One, Caroline Bailey, and our mental health professional, Albert Sherdom. So we're all here at a round table to talk to you about our Hope One project and about how we travel the county each week offering services uh, right from the truck. So we've stopped at over 500 locations since we launched back in 2017, and we've made over 15,000 contacts in the community, training over 2,800 people with life-saving Narcan. So these are our Narcan kits that were actually out in the community arming residents to save a life. So we talk to family members, we talk to friends, we talk to neighbors, we talk to even the person struggling to get them help, get them resources, and let them know more importantly that they're not alone. So people will ask us, you know, does Hope One work? You know, have you saved anybody's life? And, and really, it's, it's hard to answer, but 46 of our Narcan kits have come back as used. So someone saved it, whether it was a neighbor or a parent. They used their Narcan kit to save somebody's life, give them a second chance. And that's really what Hope One's all about. Let's give people a second chance. Let's get them help. Let's plant the seed. Because maybe the first time we talk to someone, they don't want help but maybe the next time they do. So we're here, we're here as a resource for you in the community. You can always uh, visit Hope One. You can see us and ask for help. You can email Sheriff Gannon, will go out of his way to help anybody he can, whether it's an ID card to get this person their identity back, or whether it's a Narcan kit to make a, a loved one feel like they have something to help. So tonight we asked you, our audience, to start the conversation, to end stigma with people struggling with substance use disorders and mental health. So our first question is, how do we find Hope One in the community? And the answer is easy. You can visit the Morris County Sheriff's Office website. You can click on Hope One and our calendar will come up and you can visit us. We're out normally nine to two, but we go out all different hours to try and you know make sure we're able to connect and meet people. And our other, uh, the other thing I wanna mention is you can actually schedule a visit. So if you have a location that you want us to come to, if you have a group that you need us to speak to, we are available. We will make sure that we make the time to come and talk to um, our residents. So our first question that we have tonight is for Tracy. Tracy, who do kids go to most when they're struggling with suicidal thoughts? So the majority of times kids 
go and speak to their friends. Um, there was actually a study that showed that 67% of youth would tell a friend that they were suicidal before they told uh, a parent um, or an adult because sometimes kids don't want to tell an adult because adults could be judgmental or think they're dramatic. So that's why at the Mental Health Association, we go into schools and educate youth on suicide prevention because they're the most underutilized resource when it comes to that. Thank you, Tracy. Chelsea, you have our next question. Yeah, our next question is what stigma-free language should we as a community use for mental health and substance use disorder? We'll start with Kelly. Um, so there's there's lots of different language that we can change. First of all, saying substance use disorder is is perfect. Uh, we're trying to stay away from substance abuse. We're trying to stay away from uh, clean or dirty. We're trying to stay away from um, lots of different language. If you look at NCAD, they have different uh, language matters. Um, uh, like courses you can take to tell you how to speak about it and, um, you know, really inform everyone what the right kind of non-stigmatizing language is. Tracy? So when we're talking about mental health, we want to avoid ifs. Um, so schizophrenic, um, because we don't want to put someone in a box. Um, we're made up of many different things, so we shouldn't be defined by one aspect. Uh, when we're talking about suicide, we want to avoid saying committed suicide as it has a negative connotation. Instead, we want to encourage phrases as died by suicide. Um, and when we're talking about suicide attempts, we want to avoid saying failed or successful. Not only is it unnecessary, but these words imply judgment. So instead, we want to encourage the use of phrases such as suicide attempt or death by suicide. Thank you. That's all we have, Sheriff. We're going to turn it over to you. We actually do have one more question. We, do? we have one more okay. question. Yeah. Is there an age limit to services being provided to members of the community? Kelly, you want to start off? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's uh, different programs for, for youth and adults. Um, one thing that I mentioned as far as, and you mentioned as well, Erica, as far as Narcan trainings, um, anyone can get Narcan trained and, and carry a Narcan kit. So there's not, um, there's not an issue with our youth for that. So at our organization, at the Mental Health Association, we really provide education to youth. So youth groups, um, like I said, we go into schools. Um, so that's where we in the Morris County area focus on youth resources. And also, too, we provide information referral. Um, so if you're ever looking for something out of county, even out of state, um, we'll track something down for you. Thank you so much. Sheriff? Sure, thank you. Thank you for all uh, being on the call. Uh, why don't we go around table and go over some closing remarks if we could. Uh, I, I see some people on that Hope One team uh, that are out there all the time. Harry, Al, you know, uh, Chelsea, uh, the whole gang out there. Give us some closing remarks. Uh, what you're seeing on this, you guys were out today. You guys were across the street today at 51, right? Um, give us some closing remarks, what your thoughts are. Yep, I guess I'll start. I feel like, um, first of all, if I'm yelling, just tell me to stop because <laughs> I feel like I have to scream across the room to put my voice in there. So um, <laughs> I do want to say thank you, um, Attorney General, Sheriff Gannon, um, for uh, opening up the conversation. I think it's super cool. Um, I think it's important. I love the way that Tracy put it is like, 
I forget her actual words, but I think it's like an untapped sort of resource to have adolescents and, and kids in, in grade school and high school to sort of start the conversation. I don't think that it's that you're ever too young to sort of have an honest conversation, whether it be with your friends or at home or out in the community to see like, hey, what you know, what can we do about suicide awareness or substance use? So I just want to get that out there. It was pretty cool to see uh, my lovely uh, colleague Kelly Labar speak to Attorney General outside the Hope One unveiling back in August, and uh, she's like, Attorney General, we have to get we have to get something together for uh, for the kids. And uh, Attorney General was like, You're right. Uh, so here we are. Um, so I commend everyone for being able to get it together so quickly. Um, as far as Hope One is concerned, Sheriff, I'm going to use some of your words: um, a cup of coffee and a conversation. Um, and that is what the team was doing today outside um, our promise, our family promise in Morristown. Um, it is really just coming to to start the conversation like this this webinar is titled um, how can we help um, anyway you know whether that's uh, getting a Narcan kit we can we can train I believe that the four milligram Narcan nasal spray was designed for the six-year-old to Narcan the parent and it has happened um, it is so user-friendly and crisis friendly these are words that I use all the time uh, when doing the trainings right from the truck so as long as we have parents' consent and they're cool and, and whatever it is, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy. Kelly's more than happy. The whole team from CARES is more than happy to get um, Narcan into the hands of people that need it, want it, and can use it. So um, it's super cool. I mean, we can navigate um, treatment services right from the truck. Telephone recovery support is something that we offer. Like anything, I, you can call me. I'll give you my personal phone number if you want to speak to me personally. You know, the 30-year-old the chick with tattoos. If, if you want to call me at, at 11 o'clock at night, I'll pick up my phone. We don't even have to talk about anything specific. Just let me know how your day is going. Because um, it is. It's crazy. Um, you know, with adolescents and kids these days, you know, we're, we're going through a lot, man. Um, so we're happy to help. Uh, just with human connection is really what I'm trying to say. Just with human connection. It doesn't even have to be about recovery services per se. So I think that's the spirit of Hope One. Uh, that's what we are doing out there today. That's what we'll do out there tomorrow and uh, hopefully for a long time to come. So thank you, everybody, for, for making this happen. Tracy, Kelly, um, thank you guys so much for, for sharing your stories. And I'll give the rest of these guys a chance to talk, and I'll stop screaming. Yeah. yeah I, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sir. No, 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 sure. Hope one, 56 percent of the cases where you're placing people are drug cases, 44 or so mental health cases. Uh, Al, you know, uh, you do a phenomenal job out there. Tell us what's going on. Yeah. So uh, that is the one thing that has stuck out to me uh, is the, you know, the, the co-occurring uh, mental health and, uh, and addiction. Um, so often we see that uh, in particular folks struggling with homelessness around our area um so that that's the humbling part of it uh but as carrie's you know put it perfectly uh this team is tireless uh you know we, we rely on each other we got we have each other's backs and i think that's what makes it so successful because we know uh if i'm handing off a client uh to cares uh you know i know that they're going to take good care of them and i hope they feel the same back but that's reciprocated uh because that's ultimately what we're here for to put the needs of those uh who are struggling ahead of our own and I think that's why this program has been uh, you know, the success it is. I, I can say personally, uh, the you know, I've kept our homeless outreach group uh, very busy. I want to give a shout out to the tireless. And uh, I think she's a superhero, Danielle Para, because I know I've, I've kept them busy trying to help uh, get folks off the uh, uh, start the process of, you know, getting them off the streets and hopefully, um, you know, into shelter and, and, and begin that process of, um, you know, getting uh, getting them help. So. Uh, that's that's you know and, and I always give you credit, Sheriff, and um, and because uh, this is genius and it's practicality. Um, you know, it, it really is. You know, it's just I'm I'm a little angry that I didn't think of it. Like that's how wonderful it is, and uh, you know, you, you did a great job. This is a great thing, and um, you know, I'm glad to be a part of it. So, thank you, thank you. Tomorrow, you know, 354 documented homeless in Morris County. Tomorrow, Hope One has an early one. You have a 6A and a 9A, right? Out in the community, homeless encampments. Um, phenomenal work out there. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making the difference. Uh, Kelly and Tracy, you've done a great job on this presentation tonight. Uh, Prosecutor Carroll, uh, can you have some closing comments? Closing comments, sir? Any thoughts you have? 
I do. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank both Kelly and Tracy for an excellent presentation. Obviously, to the uh, the Hope One team for uh, what they're doing out there. Um, I'd like to especially thank you, Sheriff. Uh, your vision and your consistent support of this great initiative uh, is uh, is quite impressive. Uh, General Graywell, um, you have uh, shown from the time you took office that uh, this was a statewide initiative. Uh, this isn't limited to any community. It isn't limited as people uh, uh, sometimes allege that you know, this is primarily problems in the urban areas. Uh, that is not true. Uh, we know it's everywhere. Um, and I also accept the concept that the criminal justice system is not the answer. Uh, prevention, innovation is. I mean, the goal has to be to return people that are recovered subject, subjects back into the community where they can be productive. We all have a lot to gain by uh, making productive citizens uh, out of people who have struggled with a problem. I think this is going to be a real challenge going forward coming out of uh, the COVID. Uh, uh, situation, um, the economy, um, the, the health issues, the challenges, the, literally the change in our culture that this has required um, has produced a lot of anxious and some people feeling very, feeling very hopeless. Um, it's really going to fall down to um, uh, government to a great degree, to the professionals out there that are committed to this. Uh, and I just want everyone to know that the uh, prosecutor's office is committed uh, to this to this initiative. Um, we believe with the alliance with the state and most importantly with the with the communities to reach out and, and hear their problems and see if there's areas that we can, can help. Um, we have to be committed to that because we have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's a hell of a challenge. And the one thing I, I really believe in that uh, we are all operating in a very historical time. Um, years from now, decades from now, uh, generations from now, in fact, uh, what happened during the COVID crisis in 2019 and 2020 will be 2020 rather will be will be studied and will be analyzed, um, and we're there. We're on the front line of this, and I think that um, uh, we've we've been working hard to try to find the best solutions, but it doesn't stop. It's only begin. So um, thank you all uh, for your efforts, and um, I'm privileged and honored to be part of this tonight. Thank you, Prosecutor. General Graywall. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, I'll be brief. I just want to thank all the participants. I want to thank Kelly and, and, and the Hope One team. And I want to thank uh, also Tracy for, for her, um, the resources she shared. I think the bottom line is everyone's hit on this. This is just an incredibly difficult time. And if you were suffering from substance use disorder, if you were suffering with, with some sort of mental health issues or going through a particular crisis, it's all been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and it may seem like you're disconnected because we live now in this virtual world and we're not seeing people as frequently as we usually see them. But I think one thing hopefully tonight's conversation helped uh, in doing is letting you know that there are resources here for you. There are people who care about you. There are people literally who give you hope or should give you hope that there is recovery, that there are, there is help for you, that you can get through this. And I think, you know, we talked about stigma a moment ago. That's part of it. Part of it is having this conversation. Part of it is talking openly that it's okay to suffer with something and you can get help and you can get better and you can deal with it. And you can address these issues. You're not defined by your disease. You're not defined uh, by your condition. You're not defined by your worst moment. Uh, and, and that should be apparent when you have uh, the chief law enforcement officer of your county, when you have the sheriff of your county, when you have all of us telling you that we are here to help you get through this, we're help, we're here to help each other get through this. And that's the only way when we write that history decades from now, we can look back and say, hey, we met the challenge of this moment head on in so many different ways, whether it was the opioid epidemic, whether it was the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it was the racial justice issues and the reckoning that we're dealing with in that regard. We did it. We came together at this moment and we helped everybody through and we were stronger for it. And so uh, I am really optimistic to end my night with a conversation like this. And if you are uh, in need of help, you should be optimistic, too, that there's so much help out there for you right now. General, thanks so much. I just want to just want to uh, end this conversation, and it's a uh, maybe this is just the beginning, right? Maybe this is just beginning, but you know, 
start the conversation. Start the conversation. Talk about these issues. One takeaway tonight, uh, encourage your children's interests, right? Whatever they may be. Uh, listen to people without judgment. You know, we say on Hope One, we take people where they are geographically and clinically, right? Geographically and clinically. Who knows what's going on in all of our lives or in years gone by? Maybe be kind, right? Be kind. And I think we're pretty good at it. Um, I think people can get better at it, right? Be kind to people when you see people on the street, you know, be kind to people. Uh, as we all know, uh, on the documented homeless and, and people we deal with in the community, uh, many times we're their friends. We're the only friends they have at that moment. They're in a dark spot or whatever the case may be. You don't realize the impact that you're having out there on the street every day. I certainly do, okay? But you're making an impact every day on people uh, and you'll be doing that real early tomorrow morning, okay? So thanks for this. Uh, thank you, General Prosecutor. Thank you all for this. This is the first of many, okay? But start the conversation. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Good night.